have uh, Pastor Howard with us and Sister Marilyn, and of course we want to honor our ministers here, Reverend Price and Sister Betty, that have labored for so many years of pastoring, and I was so blessed while ago to realize that they actually had met before, that they had been some time back, but uh, uh, been that uh, Pastor Howard living up in Virginia, and, and of course Reverend Price and Sister Betty used to live up in Virginia, and so there was a time there when they had seen each other and got to know each other before, so we're glad for that. And, and I tell you, we're glad for our elder statesmen that are in our churches and what have you. We look to them for wisdom and guidance. I tell you, it's been a precious relationship for me as I've gotten to know uh, older ministers through the years, and now I'm becoming one of them. <laughs> and so it's been a, an amazing thing. I had uh, several in Jamaica that I had such fellowship with, and uh, they had such love and care for myself and others, and so. Uh, it's always a great blessing to have these folks to speak into our lives and to be around us and, and to pray for us, of course. And so we're grateful today we honor these ministers uh, as we come before God and His Word today. And we do want to direct your attention to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians 2, we'll read verses 9 through 16. Again, we welcome you today. We're glad that you're here. We know that some of our brethren are bereaved or those who have lost loved ones or others who have faced a great difficulty. We appreciate everyone that's here today, those that are watching by live stream. We pray for our church family wherever they are. We know that uh, sometimes some are working and different things, and wherever you are, uh, we try to hold our family up in prayer, of course, and believe God for each one. And we pray today that folks will be marvelously strengthened uh, through this service. We're looking to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 9. The Bible says and gives us this passage but as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered in the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the world, but words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. This passage of scripture goes along well as a companion passage to what we gave last Sunday uh, when we spoke from Romans chapter 8, when the Bible gives us uh, that passage of scripture that has to do with being carnally minded or spiritually minded. Uh, the word of God says in verse 6 of Romans 8, for being carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So in some ways, this is a part two of what we began last Sunday as we were talking about being spiritually minded. And I think it's such a powerful topic, and it's obvious from the one verse in Romans uh, that life and death both are all uh, within this context that the Bible talks about, that if we are spiritually minded, it's life, but to be carnally minded is death. I mean, oh, brother, that means that this is a serious topic, and it's worthy of our time and our attention. Isn't that true? And so we're taking a little time to look at what the Bible has to say about being uh, spiritually minded. There's a few other scriptures in the Bible that have life and death all in the same verse. I'm sure that you remember uh, Deuteronomy 30 where the Bible says uh, that God says uh, to the people at that time, I'll call heaven and earth to record this day against you. Therefore, I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. Well, brethren, we have a choice before us whether or not we will live our lives being spiritually minded or whether we will allow the, the carnality that exists in the human flesh, whether or not we will allow that to dominate our lives. Isn't that true? And there is so uh, much uh, evidence, you know, that people are denial, in denial concerning supernatural things, spiritual things. Obviously, in a church, we should expect a pastor to teach us, you know, about things having to do with being spiritually minded. Uh, but we realize uh, in this world that we live in, a lot of folks are denying that there is a supernatural and denying that we are anything other than flesh. I said to you last week that we are more than just a physical body. Can you say amen? Yes. That the Bible gives us ample scriptures to let us know that we are a spirit possessing a soul living in a body. Isn't that true? 
Sometimes we use the Spirit so interchangeably, but the Bible says that God's Word can divide asunder even between spirit and soul. Yes. We have a rough time with it, but the Word of God can actually divide between wow. spirit and soul. God knows the very thoughts and intents of the heart, and the heart, we believe, is in many ways as the same thing as the word spirit that we often find in the Bible. You'll find that when they thought it was the human spirit, they would try to give us a small case S for spirit. When they thought it was the Holy Spirit, the translators, they would give us a capital S to try to indicate that they're talking about the Holy Spirit. Isn't that true? Whether they got that right every time or not, it's hard to tell. That's what the translators did, trying to help us to know the context, to know what it was they were talking about. But we believe it's interchangeable. When you talk about the heart of man, you're also talking about the spirit of man. Isn't that true? That's the part of you uh, that is eternal. Amen. And so therefore we uh, deal with that and helping people as best we can through the scriptures to be conscious of it and to realize that God has called us to be spiritually minded. Now I realize, you know, even Brother D.O. Moody, he would say, look here, you don't want to be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. <laughs> Now, I submit to you, you have to be a certain amount, uh, you have to have a certain amount of heavenly mindedness to be any earthly good. <laughs> but I realize people get out of balance, you know, and sometimes among Pentecostals, folks kind of want to show off their spirituality. Isn't that true? They want to show folks that they're spiritual. And some people believe it means that you've got to be serious all the time, that you can never laugh or play with your kids and things like that. You know, people get warped and and all that kind of thing. We do have a natural body to contact this world. We have a soul, which is the mind and will and emotions, as best we can tell. And then we have a spirit that is, of course, as we said, the part of us that is eternal, the part of us that needs to be born again. Isn't that true? And so therefore, we approach the scriptures and asking for God's help that we can be spiritually minded. If spiritually minded is life, and then all the other options are death. <laughs> I mean, oh, we need to talk about this. Can you say amen? Uh, and you know, Paul the Apostle said to the church at Corinth, we read here, of course, from Corinthians, he called them in the next chapter carnal. He said that they were carnal or ruled by their bodies, or we might say they were ruled by natural impulses. I mean, it's really not right for people who have been made new in Christ Jesus to live under the natural impulses just like people who have never been transformed by God's power. It doesn't make sense for us if we've been made new in Christ to continue living uh, in the old way. That's right. If we're still living under the same old natural impulses that we lived in before we got saved, how many of brethren that ought to cause us to have a few questions? Amen. That's right. I tell you, we want to be spiritually minded. In other words, we want our minds renewed to God's word. We want to be aware. I mean, if you're dead spiritually, that means that you're you don't have any real connection with God, that you're not alive to God. When you're alive spiritually, when you get born again, that's when that happens, of course. You're made alive in Christ Jesus. When you are made alive, of course, then you're alive to God, and you're alive to spiritual things, and you realize that there is a supernatural world. Uh, we're not encouraging people, you know, to have such curiosity in the supernatural that they spend all their time just trying to look at everything that has to do with the supernatural. But we have to let people know that that world exists. It's very real. And you're very much a part of it. Isn't that true? Yes. And so it's up to you to choose whether or not you're going to walk in a way that is spiritual. The Bible says, of course, uh, God says to Israel that I'm calling on you to choose, uh, you know, concerning these things, life or death. He said, I said before you these things, choose life. The book of Proverbs says, in the way of righteousness is life. And in the pathway thereof, there is no death. Uh, that's what I'm interested in. Can you say amen? amen. If being carnally minded is death, I want to be free from being carnally minded. I don't want to be dominated by just natural impulses or dominated by the things of the world or the devil or anything else like that. Can you say amen? <laughs> well, as we look to the scriptures, of course, we've used 1 Corinthians 2 as our foundation text. And, of course, we've read a scripture that is very popular. You'll notice that the Bible says... But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for them that love him. And of course, we've uh, heard that uh, scripture many times. And it goes on to say, of course, that only those who are actually spiritually minded, the spiritual man, can receive the things of God. It says the natural man cannot receive the things of God. Well, we need to realize then, of course, then, that uh, if we cannot receive the things of God as a natural man, then uh, we need something to happen to us so that we won't live as a natural man. Can you say amen? 
Uh, we are a spirit person. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, with the heart man believeth under righteousness. We believe he's talking about the spirit of man. With the heart man believeth. One preacher got this all turned around and he said, you know, uh, there's no way, you know, that you could really be talking about heart because if uh, something happened to your heart, then your blood wouldn't pump right all through your body. <laughs> but I mean, it's not talking about uh, the heart, you know, the physical pump, the physical blood pump that's believing under righteousness, he's talking about your inner man. Yeah. The Bible calls him the hidden man of the heart. Yeah. Isn't that true? That hidden man of the heart, the part that, that nobody else sees, that's the real you that's living inside this temporary tent. Oh, yeah. Amen. There's coming a day when I'm going to lose my earth suit. Isn't that true? How many of that would be a good reason to give people to walk spiritually? Because it won't be too long. You're not going to have your body anyway. Amen. <laughs> So you might ought to go ahead and get used to the fact and get inclined to the fact that, you know, your spiritual life is going to have so much to do with your life from this point on. Isn't that true? Amen. And, of course, always has. But now sometimes we're just becoming conscious of it, becoming conscious of the supernatural world. Those of us watching my live stream, I realize that atheism is being taught in America so much so that people have come against anything that has to do with the supernatural, and they just make a joke out of it, you know, at Halloween time or whatever. And in many ways, Americans are very shielded from the reality of the supernatural. Mm -hmm. If you do a missions trip and get off an airplane in Haiti or Africa or anywhere else, the little children all know about the supernatural. The little five to six-year-olds, they already believe, they already know, and they know there's a supernatural world. Yeah. It's over here where we're getting educated out of our intelligence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> And we act like we don't believe in the spirit world, we don't believe in the supernatural, but here you are, you're a spirit being, possessing a soul, living in a body. Amen. Thank God there's a wonderful new birth that waits for all those who call yes. upon the name of the Lord. The Bible says they shall be saved. Yes. What is it they get saved from? They get saved from spiritual death. Yes. They become alive to God. Isn't that true? Amen. These are some of the things we're emphasizing because uh, unless people, Christian people particularly, of course, we're thinking of when uh, we're thinking of walking and living in the light of the things of the Spirit. If they don't do that, uh, then they will actually begin to drift away from the things of God. This is what is happening. I believe it has happened somewhat in America that Christians have become desensitized to things that have to do with the, with the Spirit. Amen. I mean, no, brethren, with all that's been pressing in on us and the tremendous amount of things that are going on in our society, uh, these things that are coming against us, if we're not careful, it will dull us down spiritually. We'll get the place where we're not as, uh, as alive as we once were. We'll get the place where we are deadened spiritually, that our conscience has become dampened down and our conscience has become callous. One of the words uh, has to do with the conscience in the New Testament has the idea of being callous. It has the idea, you know, of being seared over like with a hot iron. Uh, one fellow said that he saw a man uh, take up a cup of coffee. The man was up near 90 years of age and... He had just done this every day for years and years. We just sent his old coffee cup. It was a long time ago, uh, back in the middle of the 20th century. And he uh, picked up that coffee cup right off the old wood stove while it was bubbling and drink it coffee right down. And the young boy, you know, that watched him do that, you know, he said he hollered when he saw that guy pour that boiling coffee down his throat. He said he just hollered. But he realized he didn't do that on the first day, that that man had been doing that year after year after year until he got all of those tissues seared over in his mouth, his tongue, his throat, and everything else. And he had just drinking a little hotter, a little hotter, a little hotter every day until finally he'd just take that cup of coffee and pour it down his throat while he was practically boy. Mm. I mean, it got seared over. And that's what happens to believers over time if we're not careful. If we allow ourselves to give up our devotional life and we don't keep ourselves in the Word of God, little by little we'll become deadened to the things that are around us. We'll get used to the dark. Uh, we'll get to the place that our conscience is not speaking to us the way it did. Remember what I said to you last week? Conscience is the voice of the spirit. Yes. Reason is the voice of the mind. Yes. Feelings is the voice of the body. Yes. Your physical body, of course, is very real. We ought to pay attention to our feelings. It can help us immensely. But how I many know you couldn't live your whole life by your feelings? If you did, you'd believe something different about every 90 seconds. Mm -hmm. That's right, your feelings go back and forth a lot. 
mental reasoning is there for a reason. <laughs> God has given you reason, you know, since you, you know, and some, I've heard some people tell people when they come into church, just, just check your brain back at the back door and all your logic and reason, just leave that outside. I'm here, bring your brain in with you when you come. <laughs> God gave you that to help protect you and so you can reason and God can cause our minds to be renewed and help us with our discretion. And the Bible teaches here that if you and I follow the things of the Spirit, the Bible says, He that is spiritual judgeth all things. You will develop a tremendous sense of, of discretion, a tremendous sense of being able to discern what's going on. Brethren, we need everything that the Bible teaches here about walking and living in the Spirit. Isn't that true? Paul said to the Romans, if you're carnally minded, it is death, but if you're spiritually minded, it is life and peace. He says to these Corinthians, and we know the backdrop for Corinth, the Corinth was the Las Vegas of the ancient world. They were involved in so much, uh, uh, so many things that were so sinful. They had the, the temple worship there uh, that actually had to do with a lot of uh, sinful things that were taking place and the worship of the, of the goddess at the temple and all that. And so this is the type of area that they're in. And some of that has made its way into the church. Whenever Jesus, you know, sought to bring healing to his own hometown, the Bible says because of their unbelief uh, that he was not able to perform uh, certain things. And there's only just a few people that were healed of minor ailments. The Bible said he could not do any mighty work. So the word of God says he went around about teaching. Teaching is the answer for unbelief. Isn't that true? Their unbelief hindered his ministry. Well, you got a place like Corinth, and they are uh, a place that is so much a, a place of carnality and sinfulness and lust and all that. How are you going to help people in this area? Some of these people have been born again, but they're baby Christians. He tells them they're babes in 1 Corinthians 3. There's a real parallel sometimes between spiritual growth and physical growth. The Bible speaks about babies. It speaks about those who are children. Ephesians chapter 4, for us not to be children, tossed back and forth with every wind of doctrine. And then it also in the same chapter it talks about being full grown in Christ Jesus. Amen. So what does he say to them? Of course, that they need to grow. They're babies, but he also says they're carnal. Now that sounds like two words that ought not go together. Carnal Christian. Why do you get those two words together? But Paul told the church at Corinth they were carnal. You see what it was, their environment round about them had influenced how they were living within the church. I mean, the influence ought to be the other way around. We as the church ought to be influencing the community around us. Yes. Amen. So what does he do? He writes them and makes them a, you know, more alert about spiritual things, more aware, I should say. He's writing them uh, to try to help them be more aware of the things of the Spirit. See, if they begin to walk in the light of who they are in Christ Jesus, they're not going to walk like those that are out there worshiping in the temple worship, the goddess worship, and all the acts, all the sinful acts that was a part of that worship. It was running their lives. It was dividing their church. It was a divided church and a disgraced church and all of that because they were not walking and living in the light of what God had done for them. They've been. I mean, no, it's not automatic. But once you get born again, you've got to live in the light of what God has done in your life. Isn't that true? <laughs> so we're seeking to see folks grow in the Lord. And we believe that folks are growing and that they will grow. Amen. Uh, Peter said if people just get sincere milk, they'll grow. That lets us know some folks are not even getting the milk. No. Paul said he hadn't fed the church at Corinth, the meat. When I read what's in the, the book of Corinthians, I think, that's not even the meat, that's the milk. <laughs> he said, I haven't uh, given you the meat yet. And he said, you're not able. Uh, but just as Peter said, that if you can just give folks the milk, there'll be some growth. How I many know, brethren, you have to grow spiritually once you get born again. Yeah. Thank God you're like a new baby. You have no past. Isn't that true? We can rejoice about being new in Christ Jesus. I rejoice about that all the time. That means there's no past. If you go down here uh, to the maternity ward at the hospital, you go to look at all those little babies out there. There was five born at the same time when Aaron Wayne was born. Here they just filling up in little beds with, with babies all over the place. But nobody can accuse those babies of anything because they're new. They've never done anything. They've never been here before. Uh, nobody can make accusation against them. Right. What we right. preached last Sunday, there is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. Romans 8 starts out, there's no condemnation at the beginning, and then says there's no separation at the end of the chapter. All right. 
If that chapter doesn't bless your soul and knock your hat in the creek, I don't know what it's going to take. <laughs> have to get somebody encouraged. Yeah. But the heart of it is, is the work of the Holy Spirit and believers walking and living in the light of what the Holy Spirit's doing in their lives. Amen. It is to be spiritually minded. Amen. I tell you, we want to help folks be spiritually minded, to grow up in the Lord, to get aware and be conscious of what it is they're dealing with. How many of you are always so much better off when you know what you're actually having to deal with? But there's a real spirit that's coming against us. We have opposition, and there are things that are going on that's trying to make it where that, uh, that the Bible is unattractive to us. There's things going on that uh, try to make us feel like God is very remote, that heaven is irrelevant. I mean, that's why people get more carnally minded that the Bible's irrelevant. Hell is inconceivable. Hello. <laughs> but see, when you're alive to God and alive to his word, if his word means anything to you, you realize that hell is a real place to be avoided. Can you say amen? Yeah. And that heaven is a real place that is the actual desirable destiny. Can you say amen? That's right. I said to you last week, heaven is not the default destination. Amen. People come into this world, if they do nothing, they're going to wind up in the same place where the enemy is going to be. If they persist in their union with the enemy, I mean, the folks are going to wind up in the same hell that the devil winds up in. That's right. Now, thank God you can break that union. Can you say amen? amen. Uh, you can break the power of darkness and be delivered from the power of amen. darkness and translate it into the kingdom of God's Praise dear son. God. It's a spiritual kingdom. It's a supernatural kingdom. It's a kingdom that it reigns over the natural world. Can you say amen? And here we are, brethren, we're not living in the natural. We're walking and living in the spirit as believers. That doesn't mean that we don't enjoy a lot of things that God has given us to enjoy through our physical bodies and other things. It doesn't mean we ought to get out of balance. doesn't mean we ought to be some type of a space cadet where, you know, some people's idea of spirituality is, you know, that there's somebody that his head is way up in the heavens and that... Uh, they never deal with things here in the natural world. They're just kind of walking around in a daze. That that's what makes them spiritual. That they just <laughs> but I tell you, that's whenever you really get spiritual, when you really do mature in the Lord, is when you can actually enjoy the things of this life in the right way. Isn't that true? I tell you, I can go out deer hunting. When I'm out there deer hunting, I can give God the glory for the beauty of nature. Amen. I give God the glory that I got health and strength to get out there and get back to the truck again. <laughs> I get out there and give God the glory. You know, everything I look around, I realize this is my father's world. Can you see? Amen. Amen. Yes. It doesn't mean I deny the natural world. It doesn't mean I try to act, you know, super spiritual. Uh, one fellow I heard about said, you know, uh, that he went to a house as an evangelist. He went there and stayed at the pastor's home. And while he's there with the pastor, the little children and his wife just cowered around the pastor like he's so fearful of him. And he never had a kind word to say to his family, anything else like that. But he's supposed to be so super spiritual. I mean, the real spirituality, brother, is going to be manifested in the fruit of the Spirit, the love of God. Amen. And you're going to have a right relationship with your children. You're going to want to play with your children. I, I've played with Aaron all these years like that. He and I, we still wrestle about every night. He tells me he's going to get the hand of victory. He, he told me before I left, I was going down when I got back. I tell you, we've had fun and played. Not the biggest thing you've ever seen in your life. Some people act like, you know, if you're being spiritual, that means you can't enjoy some of these type of things. But how I many know, oh, brother, we're talking about biblical spirituality. Yes. Not some kind of weird, peculiar thing somebody came up with somewhere. But real spirituality, real joy in living. I tell you what, whenever you get born again and start walking with the Lord, that's when the real joy of being alive and living, that's when it all comes together for you. Sometimes we've been doing it so long, we've got forgot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good for us to be remembered this morning, how much better we are, how much uh, uh, better off we are, because we know who Jesus is, and God has made us alive spiritually. If I walk outside and the sun is shining, I can say, my Heavenly Father, put that sun right there. Can you say amen? If it's raining, then I can say, I thank God our God has a way of keeping everything uh, green. And you don't let everything get brown. I, everything around here is pretty green right at the moment, or soon will be when, when spring is and everything. <laughs> but whatever I see, I realize that this is this all because of my heavenly Father. Amen. Well, what I see in this, brethren, in many ways is a Godward side and a manward side to this relationship, of course, that we have. God says here, look, I'm preparing and revealing. We read the verses. He's prepared these things for us. And then the Bible says, but he has revealed them to us. Verse number 10, but God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. 
Now, we'll take verse 9 and make a funeral scripture out of it, and we'll get up and we're pretty much just talking about heaven. We'll say, well, I haven't seen here, I haven't heard. We're thinking about people haven't seen heaven. But that's not in exactly what he's talking about in this passage. And the truth is, we haven't seen all the glories of heaven. Uh, some people have had an experience where they feel that they saw heaven, and I believe some of those are true. Uh, but what he's talking about here has to do with our actual lives here, our daily lives. You see, he's quoting Isaiah 64, verse 4, verse number 9, but as it is written, he's quoting an Old Testament passage. And in the Old Testament, of course, there were so many things that they had not seen. We still see in part and know in part, but how many brethren under the New Testament, we've got a better covenant established upon better promises. Knowing the relationship of these covenants, one with the other, the Old Testament with the New, will bring rich blessings into your life. Some folks, of course, want to do away with the Old Testament just about all together. How I many know oh, that's not right? Because there's so much quotation of the Old Testament in the New. If you throw out the Old Testament, you throw out half the New along with it. <laughs> Isn't that true? <laughs> yeah. But what he's saying to us that what I had not seen, what ear had not heard, and it had not been done under that old covenant. The Bible says, verse 10 now, but God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. Yes. Only God could do that. That's the Godward side. Yes. On the manward side, the Bible teaches here, of course, that you and I, we have received this. You'll notice verse number 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. God has prepared these things for us. He's revealed them. And then he, we have received the Holy Spirit of God that will take us into all these truths. What I have not seen, I is now seeing. The Lord, what had not entered into the heart of man is now entering into the heart of man. The Bible says the Old Testament was a shadow of good things to come. Hebrews 10, 1, a shadow of things to come. How many brother, we ought not live under the shadow if we can live in the light. The New Testament is the light. Isn't that true? Yeah. Thank God for them. These things that have to do with our spirituality, we know them now. This is the one thing that caused the Lord Jesus Christ to rejoice. Think about the passage where the Bible says that Jesus said, that, uh, the Bible says he rejoiced in his spirit because he said, you have showed these things, Father, uh, to those who are babes, the things that uh, people wanted to see before. Prophets and leaders and kings and different ones of the past. They wanted to see these things but didn't see them. But Jesus rejoiced because he says, Father, now you're showing these things even unto babes. Right. We're living in this time of revelation where a person can walk in the spirit. Yeah. We can, brethren, be spiritually minded instead of being dominated by our carnal Amen. bodies. Isn't that true? Yes. Yes. Now we know God's got a future use for our bodies so we don't discredit our bodies. Our bodies has not yet received full redemption. We know there's coming another day for our physical bodies. God's going to raise them up and we're going to be able to have an immortal body throughout all eternity. But in this present hour, Paul the Apostle says himself, he says, I keep my body under. If the body was the real Paul, then Paul wouldn't say, I keep my body under. He'd say, I keep myself under. I mean, the body was the house he was living in. Isn't that true? Uh, the Apostle Peter, I've referred to it already, but the Apostle Peter said, you know, that this tabernacle that I'm in, and as long as I'm here, I'm going to remind you of certain things, but one of these days, this tabernacle will be laid aside, and that's the same word for tent. <laughs> uh, I mean, some of our tents are holding up better than others. <laughs> Isn't that right? Every once in a while, I wonder if I'm going to make it when I'm up in a crawl space at this age now. I'm up in a crawl space working around. I'm thinking, uh, I hope I can get, I can drag this big tent out of here. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but the real me, thank God, the inner man, glory to God. I'm enjoying the wonderful fellowship with the Father. Matter of fact, the Bible says God hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amen. So therefore, if you're not going to be spiritually minded, how could you enjoy spiritual blessings unless you're going to be willing to adopt what the Bible teaches about being spiritually minded? Jesus. Somebody said, I believe I'm just about tired of hearing about it. Well, I'm telling you, uh, if you begin to understand the joy and the blessing of this, that he's blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And then after that, when he gave us that verse in Ephesians 1, 3, he starts listing all the different blessings. Starts talking about how we've been adopted, our sins have been forgiven, we've been redeemed. I tell you what, when these things dawn on you, 
I uh, mean, they bring immense joy and blessing and change to our lives. And through the years, as I've said to you more than once, no doubt, many people said to me, Brother Bobby, it just doesn't seem real to me about being made new and having my sins forgiven and being the righteousness of God in Christ. These things don't seem real to me. See, that's why you've got to walk with it and, and be spiritually minded. That's the only way it's going to seem real to you if you begin to walk and act like the Bible is true. When the devil comes up with something to the contrary, you're going to have to answer him with the word of God. You're going to have to be willing to apply that by faith even when you don't feel like it. Yeah. See what I said to you about going by your feelings? If you went by your feelings, every morning when you get up, the devil will have a long list of things and mistakes that you've made somehow or another. Isn't that right? Every day you live, he's going to have some other feeling, something like this. Well, you know, you're just not feeling that good today. I'm saying, look here, devil, I'm not going to ask you whether or not I'm feeling good. <laughs> Can you say amen? I'm going to get my information from the Bible. Amen. Uh, can you rejoice this morning that you've got some inside information? Can you say amen? amen. And it's inside the Bible. Glory to God. Amen. Paul said to that to the church at Ephesus, he said uh, that you've been blessed with all spiritual blessings. And if you read through that list of blessings and finally gets there and begins to pray for them, that their eyes of their understanding would be enlightened so that they'd know what all God had done for them. All right. What do you do for folks that are in these cities? Ephesus was a lot like Corinth, and they're in cities where they're, they're actually worshiping the human body. Uh, in our nation, we've seen such a movement toward this. When people get where they worship their physical body, that's where we start getting all this confusion about lifestyles and about uh, gender and all that. When people begin to exalt the human body and the appetites of the flesh above everything else, that's why all this confusion starts coming in about whether or not people are really male or female or whether or not you know they should live this way or that way. Uh, this confusion didn't come in until people begin to exalt the physical body. You got all this imagery of people's bodies everywhere. I said to somebody that the laziest people in the world that make their living just by taking their clothes off. Mm. Yeah, yeah. That is the <laughs> that is <laughs> the worst profession there is, isn't it right? One you will not be able to keep up for a long, long time. <laughs> but it's going on all around us and it's a worship. That we think, you know, we look at Corinth and we think about how horrible that must have been with all the the things that went on, but brethren, it's not very different from what we see right now in America and around the world. This constant worship of the physical body. Oh yeah. Are you out there? They're worshiping. Uh, they even call them, you know, they're American idols. And this idolatry where people worship other human beings and worship their looks and worship their lifestyles, that is what's led to such confusion about what people actually need to do in their own lives. I tell you, I'm not going to follow people whose lives are already in a wreck. Amen. Look, Amen. Uh, their, their lives are already shipwrecked. Their lives are already messed up. Uh, they don't serve as any kind of example for any of the rest of us. I tell you, we need to raise our sights. Can you say amen? And get back to something that's more solid and sane and real. Uh, something that doesn't lead you to such utter selfishness. And all this has to do with the fact that sin is always so incredibly selfish. And that, that selfishness is an enemy to real spirituality. Oh, yeah. That self-centeredness, uh -huh. that, that selfishness is an enemy to true biblical spirituality. Oh, yeah. And that's why we're calling on folks to go to the Bible, find out, become aware. And let's pray for one another. Pray for those that we're ministering to. Let's pray for the parents of, of children and teenagers. Let's pray that people's eyes will be open, that they can see what's really going on with all this. Uh, people need to have their eyes open spiritually. Paul the Apostle prayed for the church at Ephesus. He's yeah. praying for Christians. He says, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And then he goes on to say that he prayed that they would receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. Finally, he says and prays for them that they'll know what God wrought in Jesus when he raised him from the dead. He said, I'm praying it'll dawn on you what God did in Jesus when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand far above all principality and power and might. Brethren, we need a revelation. We need some eyes opening. We need some folks to get alert again and realize there's a spiritual world. There's a supernatural. And there is a devil, but he's a defeated foe. Can you see, man? There is a devil. Uh, he has been defeated and stripped of his power. Uh, we need to wake up spiritually. Can you say amen? If the church will wake up spiritually, it will have influence on the world. That's 
If the church will come alive again spiritually, how many know the world won't be impacted by it? Yeah. And I am convinced that the way in which the church fears the Lord and worships God has so much to do with the level of conviction uh, that unsaved people feel whenever they come around these church services. And in recent years, brethren, people come in out of these church services, they're not saved, they're not ready to meet God, they go in out of these services, and it's like they don't feel a thing. Uh, you know, they can smirk while they're here. I've had everyone give in the altar call before uh, that ask people about their heads. And people just smirk at me and carry on. And act like it wasn't nothing going on. That it wasn't any more important than a yard sale. Mm. You know, the reason it is because if we don't fear God within the church and walk with a spiritual mind in the church, we can't expect the world to come under any kind of sense of conviction. Mm. Old time preachers used to say to people, look here, come into the congregation. And just go around and sit around all the people coming in. We're talking about a large congregation. People come in, you know, out of the world. They were unsaved people coming into the church. And they, he would tell the prayer warrior, just go sit among them. Then maybe no matter how frozen in sin they are, that they'll thaw out by the time I give the altar call. Yeah, amen. <laughs> I tell you, I remember some of those old time services where sinners came into the church, get under such conviction that the preacher never had a chance to preach before they got born again. Oh, yes. You remember some of those things? I mean, it has to do with the church fearing God, walking in the Spirit, appreciating the work of the Holy Spirit. That's why we're able to see that kind of evidence in the services. And brother, we're going to be getting back there. Can you say amen? That's where we're headed. We're encouraging a, a real fear of God. In other words, a reverential fear. Yes. Uh, we're delivered from the tormenting fear. The Bible says perfect love casts out fear. That word fear there, that has to do with dread. That has to do with uh, being terrorized. When you look it up in the Greek, that's what it means. It's terror. It's dread. We don't come in here because we're terrorized by God. It's not because we dread Him. I mean, our brother, we fear Him because we know He's God. And He's worthy of all of our worship. He's worthy. Can you say amen? That this world can never truly satisfy you. If you give yourself over to the carnal flesh, if you give yourself to those appetites, you're just going to become in bondage to it. You're going to be bound completely by it. And they're parading all of these things in Hollywood and all around us telling us, you know, we're free, we're having a big time. Truth is, they're just like a puppet on a string. The devil just oh, uh, making him jump around, do whatever he wants to do. That's why they do such crazy things. Amen. Amen. They're, we're free. And old Freddie Mercury, been dead several years. And he was one of those that partied by the hardest. He was the kind of guy that finally just allowed himself to delve into almost every fleshly appetite that he possibly could. But he was heard to say that when he started out all that partying with the dope and with all the wild living and everything, he said, I was in control. He said after a few years of that, he found out he was no longer in control. He used to set the time when he would party and act up like that. He said later on, he had to do. He had to keep that up. He had to go on with it. He was then in bondage to it. It mastered him. Oh, yes. I'm here today to tell you, brethren, there is freedom in Christ Jesus. Can you say amen? amen? And walking in the Spirit, as some people will look down their nose at it this morning, but I'm here to tell you, brethren, it is life. To be spiritually minded is life. To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Oh, yes. Thank God. And there's a many a person, no doubt, watching my live stream, others, they would give anything for a measure of peace this morning. And the only kind of peace there is is spiritual peace. Because this world is not at peace. Isn't that right? A lot of times families are not entirely at peace. Sometimes churches are not even at peace. But thank God you can have peace in the midst of the storm. Can you say amen? When you know who God is, when you know what God has done for you, when you're living in the light of that mighty work he's done in your life, well, there's where the peace is. Can you say amen? Amen. amen? Brethren, walking in the peace of God, looking for and being spiritually minded, is so, uh, so much like what the Bible says when it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I mean, if you're seeking the things of God first, that's being spiritually minded. Yeah. Isn't it? And you know, there are such wonderful promises that go with it. Because he said, if you seek the kingdom of God first, all these things will be added to you. He said, seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be open. Ask and you shall receive. Asking is the rule of the kingdom. Mm. But he said, if you ask, you will receive. Oh, yeah. One scripture after another, the Bible says, if you ask, you're going to be able to receive. Matter of fact, uh, you know, Matthew 7 he actually gives them that asking you shall receive. And then he says, 
if you ask your heavenly father these things, how much more? <laughs> he said the earthly father would give his children things. How much more shall the heavenly father give to those that ask him? So as you're seeking uh, to be spiritually minded, as you're seeking God's kingdom, I uh, know, brethren, you've got to know this, uh, that you have this marvelous promise that you will not be disappointed. Yes, amen. amen. Many of us have been living for God for many years. We can lift our hand, lift up our Bible. Matter of fact, it'd be good to lift up your Bible and just say, look here, I have not been disappointed. When I've asked, I've been able to receive. When I've sought him, I've been able to find. When I've knocked, the door's been open. Now, I could live like the nations of the world. The Bible says the nations of the world, all they want is what to eat or drink or wear. But Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. And that same passage is where he said, those who don't have God in their lives, all they seek for is just self-preservation. Yes. But for those who seek first the kingdom of God, it will not be denied them. They will not be disappointed. Can you say amen? Glory to God. Can we lift up our Bible one more time? I know we're ready to do it, but lift up your Bible and say, thank God I've got the Word of God. Can you say amen? And then my Bible teaches me that I can walk in the Spirit. Can you say amen? Uh, that I can have these spiritually minded glory to God. That if I seek Him, I'm not going to be disappointed. If I draw nigh to Him, He's going to draw nigh to me. Can you say amen? If I pray, if two or three of us get together, He's going to be in the midst. <laughs> if I seek Him, He's going to show up. He's going to be right there. He's going to answer prayer. Glory to God. There's so many things to be encouraged about from the Word of God. Amen. Amen. And today we are encouraged by the Holy Scriptures. I pray today that you will commit yourself afresh and anew uh, to walk in the Spirit of God, to walk in a way that is spiritually minded. I pray that there's so many benefits accordingly. Amen. Let's stand to our feet today. Honor the Lord. Amen. Yes. Randa, Shandaraba, Uyatara Baranda, Sita Baranda. My people, keep seeking my face. Yes. My power will sustain you. My joy is your strength. The wind comes and goes, and the fire will fall, saith the Lord. Praise God. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. We receive it as a word from the Lord. Let's stand together, brethren, and worship God. Thank God for His Holy Spirit's confirmation today as we honor Him, honor His presence. Let's just reach out and worship the Lord for a few moments and give Him thanks and honor and glory. Father, we glorify Your name for that which You have done in our midst, God. We give You praise for now lifting our hearts and strengthening us, God, that we may truly walk as spiritual people, Father God, in the midst of this present world. Thank you, Father God, for enlightening our mind, touching our hearts, strengthening us in the inner man, Father, we pray today. We pray for your help, God, in Jesus' name, that we might become so honest with the scriptures, God, that you'll be able to make changes in us, Father, as we humble ourselves before you and become honest before your throne, God, and before the word of God, Father, we know you're doing a mighty work in us today. In Jesus' wonderful name. Heads about for a few moments.